Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. A couple weeks ago, I asked a question. Uh, I said I was gonna go and see a YouTuber somewhere in America, and you guys made lots of guesses down at the bottom, and a few of you got it right. I am north of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin with Aaron, the impatient gardener. Uh, this morning, uh, you wanna introduce yourself to my audience. If you haven't seen the Q&A, you will have seen a Q&A video at this point, hopefully, and if you haven't, this will be your first introduction to Aaron, maybe. Yeah, well, hi everybody, and thanks, Jim. I'm so glad, it's so fun to have Jim here in my garden. Uh, like Jim said, I'm north of Milwaukee. We're right on Lake Michigan. We're, this is southeastern Wisconsin. Uh, technically, zone 5B. I could just call it zone 5 because I think the B is questionable sometimes. Right. Uh, the lake gives us a really different kind of microclimate, so we're a little bit different from everybody around us. Um, but... Um, but we can grow lots of things here. Not as much as you guys can grow, but oh, we but grow lots. Yeah, there's, and, it's, and it's, it's really, really beautiful. We're gonna walk through and show off some of the uh, really beautiful garden spaces, and Erin's gonna tell us some of her favorites uh, in, in the garden. You wanna, you wanna start us off? Yeah, back sure. Here? Sure, okay. so we can start. The area that we're standing right now is, this is our patio off our sort of front and side slash uh -huh. back doors. And this is where the garden all started. Um, this was the first area that I worked on. We uh, bought this house, uh, 20, we're 20 years here now. Mm -hmm. So this was the first area we worked on and this area has been redone three times probably over the years. So this is an area that we see the most, we travel through the most, we look at the most. So it's important. It's really important spot in the garden for us. So um, some of the things we have over here is I, I always like a little bit of height. So we've got this rosy teacups uh, cornice uh -huh. here. Um, this is probably its third year in the in the ground, and it's just flowers are just about to drop here now. Right. So and it's July. For yeah. this in, you know, uh, for where we are in North Carolina, the dogwoods have been done for a while, but we right. can grow, we can grow them. Mm -hmm. It's just an amazing, amazing difference you guys will see in this July garden versus my yep versus my uh, July garden. Yep, I work in a lot of. I like to mix perennials, shrubs, annuals, all those yeah. things. And I do work in a lot of annuals into this part of the garden, so there's a big color show. So um, one of my favorite things to grow from seed is this Salvia argentia, um, which is just such a fun plant. It'll get really quite big. It's a biennial, and it will flower in the second year. The flowers aren't the flowers are okay. It tends to get very floppy and the plant kind of goes to pieces um, after it flowers. Doesn't but I've got that worked in with some Nepeta and we've got some Cesleria there. And then I've got some Dahlias mixed in and some other annuals. Right. Um, just to sort of make this whole area really interesting um, all summer long. Right. So um, you've got some, a little bit of pine bark in here, but mm -hmm. we talked about in the first video. Mm -hmm. Aaron, this is a sandy soil from because of Lake Michigan. The shore was probably up here at some yep, point. Exactly. And so she's using compost. She's using her leaves as mulch and a neighbor's leaves as mulch. She's using a little bit of pine bark where she wants something a little more decorative right here by the entrance. Really, you know, I talk about it all the time. People are trying to sell you things, but really, yeah. at the end of the day, this is just basic organic material. Exactly. And you're planting so thick that the amount of mulch you're having to use here is... Exactly, it's, it's really minimal. In yeah. areas where I really need to cover an area if I'm creating a new garden, yeah. I'll use arborist chips right. from trees that we've yep. had taken down and I'll just lay those in there because uh -huh. I'm probably not gonna be planting there for a little bit or it's just right. really about weed suppression and those break down nicely over time and that bulks and it, up the yes, soil a little bit. Yeah, and they wake the soil up. Yep. Let's look at this side. Uh, yeah, so over here. over here we've got a lot of... Now, it doesn't look like much because they're not blooming yet, but I've got a lot of dahlias in here. These are all shorter dahlias because I grow taller dahlias kind of along the house. Mm -hmm. But these are all generally shorter ones. I like to mix my dahlias in like a garden plant. Yeah. I don't necessarily, I think you do the same thing. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't necessarily think of them only as cut flowers. So I work them in through here. I've got a clematis right in the middle that's just, I can't even remember which one that is. Um, but it just is a, sorry, I allow it to sort of ramble. And then since there's sort of so much going on in the background of this garden, I like to make the front edge a little bit more orderly. And so I play around with things. So this year I put some Swiss chard in there. Yeah, which looks great. Um, just to add that nice foliage texture and you get those pretty stems. That's sort of an experiment. We'll see how that lasts through through the summer here. I think I'll be able to just keep, you know, breaking off the bad stems and it should keep keep looking okay. And if not, I can always start some more from seed and pop it in for the end of summer and it'll be it'll be just fine. Right. For those of you who don't follow your channel, I mean, you, you, you you have to dig your dahlias up here, obviously. We have to, yes. We did, yep, any dahlias I want to keep, they have to be dug and uh, stored 
uh, for winter. And you've got videos on your channel. I for, do lots of that. lots of videos on how to do all those <laughs> on, things. On, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yep. we and for us, we're in zone seven B, right on the edge, and I just leave them. Yeah. And so, and if they return once, they'll return forever for me. Okay. And so, but sometimes they don't. Yep. So that you know, it's a risky take, but over time, you end up with a, a lot. I would so. be I would be more than happy to take that risk if there was any chance of it happening. Yeah, in fact, right. there was one that overwintered alongside my house and then promptly died when it came up this spring, but it, it did leave me I might leave a couple along in this. Right. I've got a super microclimate on the south facing little corner wall there. Mulch them well. I might right. just try it with something I don't care about just to see yeah. what happens. So look, show will you Steph, will you show the uh, the planting along the uh, the foundation over here and some of the containers? Yeah. Uh, this is a beautiful space. Things that so you have a lot of containers that obviously you're going to be bringing in. Yeah, I I do, and I'm trying to sort of limit that a little bit. I get uh -huh. a little bit I get a little bit overzealous about <laughs> right. you know I get ambitious about taking things in, and then it gets to really be a drag. But like I've got little Miss Figgy in a pot. Yeah, that's really easy. I just that goes into essentially forced dormancy in the coldest corner of the basement where I store the dahlias. Right. Um, and I don't I just don't even have to really look at it except to toss a little bit of water on there maybe twice over the course of the winter. Um, and some things like I've got some Spanish lavender down there. All uh -huh. that was grown from cuttings this year. I just brought in a mother plant, overwintered it, and I think in January probably I took some cuttings, right. um, so I would have that plant again. So I, you know, it, I do get a little sick of tending things in winter, so yeah, I, I try to be pretty good about it. I've got a, a kumquat that is, you know, I don't, I don't do well with citrus, so I'm just like, just yeah. Yeah, so, hard, hard so I bring it, I bring yeah. it in because it's so pretty, but I mean, it's yeah. just now recovering from all its torture over winter, so right. it's tough here, it's really tough, and it's particularly tough for me because and I get bored with that. You're using like a tomato staking system for your dahlias with the strings and the, st and the stakes. Yep, I do a Florida yeah. weave. Now, okay. those are uh -huh. all, those are all tall dahlias, so those are probably all going to be four right. or five footers uh -huh. so all of those will be over, cover all those stakes by the time they by the time they get up there nice beautiful yeah. so you have this a small island uh planting here uh next to your driveway and then this big beautiful um herbaceous almost, almost all herbaceous perennial space behind us both of these are both of these are beautiful what are some of your well, this was kind of an interesting area because when we moved in, this was the vegetable garden. There no. was a kind of weedy patch here. Okay. And so I created this sort of circle garden. And this is this is sort of a, a juxtaposition in my garden because most of my garden is really quite sort of informal. But right. there's a certain amount of formality in this garden. So I use this to play around with things. So I generally divide it into different segments right. and try to mass plant things. Some years it is more successful than others. Uh, this year, everything is really slow and filling in. And then I have everything, uh, this is chives growing along the edges yep. here, so I've created a little chive hedge. They're just about due for a cutback, so I'll cut them all back and they'll all regrow fresh. Right. Um, but this is sort of an experimental area for me to play around with different plant combinations and see how things work together and whatever, right. just kind of change it up um, a lot in this area. And it looks great. And then behind us here, this is all a new area here. Well, new being probably 2020 uh -huh. um, is when I installed most, most of this. Um, so uh, we lost a big ash tree. A lot mm -hmm. of my gardens have come from having trees <laughs> right. be yes. lost. So you, right. you have to fill things in. And before this, this has been kind of natural and a little a little weedy even, but, but right. it was not terrible. And then of course, as soon as there was more sun, it was, let's just call it an opportunity right. to do something different. So I did do, a, there's, Primarily perennials here, very casually planted. There's got, mm -hmm. I've got like um, a few little shrubs and trees tucked in there. Um, right. And it's a bit of a work in progress, but it's it's been really nice and it goes out to the road. And the one nice thing about it has been that um, the neighbors have talked so much about it. So they all see, right. they kind of can look in here, but it, right. it never looked that great out by the end of the road. So now I've got kind of a nice entrance to our yard. Yeah, and when I was coming to your house, you know, I was looking at addresses, and I'm like, "This has got to be it," <laughs> yeah. because it was. It is. Yeah. It's very striking mm -hmm. as you come become along the road there, yep. and you've got a, a semi-dry creek. Yep. A creek. We'll see it. We'll see a little more of yep. it. You have a little bridge yep. out there yep. uh, that runs over yep. uh, over the top of it. Again, that use of like variegation and chartreuse colors, and then grasses that move that mm -hmm. are shade taller, or grass-like mm -hmm. plants, not yep. grasses, but grass-like yep. plants. It just it just looks great. Mm -hmm. Looks it looks like it wasn't planned. But it, that's, you know what I mean? Right, like which it is got, exactly what I was going for, right, exactly, yeah, yep. Yeah, that's perfect. So you obviously have deer issues. Yeah, we'll so, that, you know, this is the, 
your your impenetrable defense yep. uh, for your edible plants. Mm -hmm. uh, how long ago did you build this? We built this in 2018. Uh -huh. Prior to that, I had just a few small raised beds. Right. Um, so this was this was sort of the dream vegetable garden for me. So I've got. Right. Uh, eight four by eight beds and four like two and a half by five foot beds that I kind of mm -hmm. use for cutting gardens, flowers, right. that kind of thing. Although I sort of mix everything in. And then I've got my stock tank pond uh, in the center, which I just enjoy because I don't, I know very little about water gardening. Yeah. <laughs> so I love playing around with it. It's really fun to, it's really fun to delve right. into things that you know nothing about really. So we're in the middle of July and your tomatoes are, when will you, August typically? Uh, I'll probably I see a few on there now, so mm -hmm. probably in three weeks or so, two right. weeks, we'll start getting the first few. But really, most oh, of yeah, our we'll most of our tomatoes, we'll get those end of August, beginning of September. And then the lake kind of helps extend your it season does. a bit into the it fall. Does. Yep. So one of the projects that I did sort of for fun and for an experiment, but also because I really wanted it, was create this uh, what's called a Belgian fence. That's a form of espalier. This is all made out of royal raindrops, crab apples, and I started it um, just, I bought whips. So that is just, you know, a tree that has no branching on it yet. And then I cut them all off. I planted them all and cut them off at a foot from the ground. And then you just sort of train the branches. So what you see here in some cases is still the framework behind it, because it's going to be a couple years. This is the third growing season for this. And I just pruned this for, for summer um, just this week. So it's looking a little bit neater now. It had put out a lot of growth. But so far it's been it's been a fun experiment and it's working out pretty well. It gets really pretty flowers in spring. And I think as it fills in here, I'll be able to remove um, all of the support structure behind it in a few years, I hope. And uh, it's just kind of a nice thing at the back of the vegetable garden here. So you've got a big new addition this year. Uh, you've done a few videos yeah. about it. Uh, how, how did this come about? So we had some septic work done. Okay, so right. this whole right. area of the garden, right. we ended up having a tree taken down. Uh, another part over there was all kind of ripped up. So oh. of course, something happens, you've got an opportunity for a garden. Right. And so uh, this garden right here in particular is kind of special. Um, I worked on this with uh, Roy Diblick, um, oh. landscape gardener, who many of your viewers are probably familiar with. Right. And uh, he helped, we worked on this design together. And the whole idea was that a lot of people think that Roy's designs, which are in places like the Art Institute in Chicago oh. or the Lurie Garden, he helped Pete Odoff with that. A lot of people think that those are only for giant spaces. Okay. And, and, and Roy always wants some help getting that message across that you can have that kind of garden in a small space. Right. So we picked this area. It's about 15 by 30 or so, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we created this garden together, and he came here and planted it. And so then I used this garden design as a <laughs> springboard for some other areas that had also been ripped up. So I sort of stretched the design using some right. of the same plants that way and across the creek a little bit again into another new area right. just to kind of get bring some cohesion to this area. And you've got groupings of... Yeah, it's mostly a matrix. A lot of this is sort of matrix planting. Uh -huh. um, groupings with um, some grasses worked in often or some other perennials. And, right. and uh, you know, he designs it all in sort of clumps and then inside of that he'll put often two plants mixed together sometimes three right and so again with the idea here being that this will fill in thick enough that reducing your mulch reduce your maintenance reduce um yeah, yeah exactly and, and a lot of color exactly and right. honestly I, I did mulch it this year with leaves but um i was even thinking about not doing that but it just wasn't filling in quite as quickly right so i did do that this year but the idea is, is that the maintenance on this is going to be almost nil. Mm -hmm. um, it will stand for winter. I let basically all my perennials stand yes, for winter. Right. In spring, I will cut it. Eventually, when the plants are growing enough, I might even mow it. Mm. Um, cut it all down, mulch everything essentially in place, let everything basically lay. Right. And, uh, and that's it. And then everything will come back. And eventually, this will all fill in. And things are some things are planted closer than they technically should be. Right. And the idea is is that um, I mean Roy and I talk a lot about this, but I, I think it's a really important point, which is that you can plant things according right. to the spacing on the tag yeah, right. and wait, or you can plant things a little closer and you can edit down the road. Right. Um, so it's kind of a matter of where do you want to put your effort? Do you want to put right. your effort in taking care of That's weeds that first year, or do you want to maybe have it fill in a little sooner and have your effort be later right. when you need to edit? 
Right. And it, they'll figure it out. Yep. Yeah, that's the other thing is that plants will, you know, they will <laughs> right. move around and do their thing and you'll yeah. see that some things just aren't working and you might have to intercede and sometimes right. they'll just manage it and you'll think, well, they figured it out for themselves. So you have several, you know, it's dry creek bed, you have three uh, spots where you cross it uh -huh. and uh, Steph is standing back where you just did your new project. Yep. And this is back toward the uh, house. Uh -huh. uh, it's a beautiful view across here. You've got, you got little rooms yeah. uh, cut into here uh, in, in this space and as things mature a bit more, it's yeah, and, that, and and thankfully um, that wasn't always the case, and so I've sort of started recognizing uh -huh. that you know it, it really adds something to the right. landscape to create those areas. So I do, I am a little bit more cognizant of creating that or how I can right. create that, and and you're blocking that view until you come. Like we just curved this path this yes. year, so like right. how can you yeah. block this view until you walk down it a little bit to see what's beyond it? Right. Yeah. 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 It's a. It's a. It, and once you once you start figuring those things out, the garden really that's when the garden really comes together. Every garden that I go to that has those kind of spaces where mm -hmm. every you get another wow moment. Yeah, those are the ones that are that, that are the most fun. What what's your color here behind us? So this is uh, stackies. This is um, two types of stackies. This mm -hmm. is summer crush and humalo, um, both of which you know, this is all newly planted too. But right. they are looking really good right now. Um, and I have a, I've been adding a lot of this to the garden. It's really adaptive, sun, shade. It really does run the gamut really right. well here. So, um, and I'm really liking uh, the combination. I, I don't know that I intended to do that. And then I sort of you know, ran out of one thing, thought well, right. we'll bring in the other. And uh, I'm, right. I do like the combination of the two together. You know, what, what's interesting seeing this garden is that the woodies are definitely behind because of your shorter season. Mm -hmm. But the perennials, and including just the wildflowers around this area, mm -hmm. they jump out of the ground. They know they got a short season. They feel like, they, yeah, the cone flowers, all these things are yeah. right on time. Yeah, they they move quickly. They absolutely move quickly. Exactly. Right, and yeah. the goldfinches are already out here. Mm -hmm. You've got se their seed on things already. Yep. yep. Uh, yeah, that's kind of amazing that the perennials seem to have it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they. They got it figured out. Yeah, they definitely they're definitely more aware of the fact that that their life their lifetime here is short, so <laughs> right. they better hurry up. Yeah. Beautiful. So the tricolor beach we talked about mm -hmm. in the in the Q and A. Yep. And you've had how long did you say? Like this three years, probably. Okay. All right. One thing I want to we just talked about rooms here. You've got your larger shrubs right down the middle of the bed. This is exactly what I did and and tried to mm -hmm. you know tried to show on the channel that I think normally people would put the tall things in the very back and then middle and then front and that's the way things are supposed to go. But this is how you create the rooms. Exactly. And. Okay. And there's actually now, because we've had some work, the area behind it is not as developed, but there's actually a little, like just a really skinny little walking path yeah. that kind of bends around the back there uh -huh. so you can get to the other side of it and see it. Right. Um, and you know, I just feel like if, if you don't ever stop your eye, you just might, you kind of lose it. So right. here you stop your eye and you have to kind of walk around it. Hey, what's over there? You right. know, you have to make an effort to get over there. Um, and I think that's good for your eye. What pieces have you used here to? So this is, there's, there's three, they're all a little bit in a row here. The first thing I have is a, is a ginkgo. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately it was, had a tree dropped on it at one point. So it <laughs> lost its leader and it's all bendy, but it can keep growing kind of funky. Right. And it's Seussian. just a standard uh, one yeah, that'll get bigger. Yeah, it's a gold, um, uh -huh. one of the, one of the tall right. gold ones. But it looks great, kind of like yeah. that. Just, yeah. yeah, I just kind of let it get kind of rangy right, there. Yeah. Then we've got uh, two um, Onondago viburnums mm -hmm. here. Those are interesting because when I started a lot of this part of the garden over here, I started much of it uh, right. from a online group. This is pre-Facebook. Um, that was like a plant buying group. Uh -huh. And so those and many other shrubs were in four inch pots when I oh, bought them. I love buying. I, small pots are my, my game. Yep. That's, my, that's my thing right there. Yep. And then uh -huh. to the left of that, I've got a Rixa japonica, uh -huh. which is a really cool plant that I knew nothing about. I went to Clem's Song Sparrow Nursery right. way back in the day when Roy Clem still owned it. And they said, you really should have this plant and you don't argue with Roy Clem. So I bought it and uh, it's got these nice shiny leaves. Uh -huh. it, it can be, it is easily pruned if you want right. to control the size. Um, it does get very minuscule flowers on it. It's 100% deer resistant. They will not go near it. Right. Um, it even has a little bit of a limey scent to it when you kind of crush the leaves. It's right. just sort of a fun, fun thing. And that's about what it does is right. just kind of do that. And, it, and you, like you just said off camera, it, it has a kind of a tropical Mm -hmm. a tropical look to it yeah so then you've got your taller growing a, a, a few mid-sized shrubs mm -hmm. and taller growing perennials in mm -hmm. the back and then just kind of leaning down yep. toward the lower growing some annuals some perennials yep. and you know blend it in and same thing carried over on the other side of the path mm -hmm. over there yeah 
so in the Q&A, we talked about your climbing hydrangea that's on the, on the tree out there. Uh, you want to talk about it again here so for people who see it in the background? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great fixture in the garden, and I do love it. So it was originally planted growing up an ash tree. We've got uh, terrible emerald ash borer issues here, so we've lost almost every ash. Uh, so when that tree died, we just topped it rather than risk losing the uh, climbing hydrangea. Now that climbing hydrangea, I think, has got to be at least 15 years old. It might even be older than that. Um, and uh, you know, as we talked about in the Q and A video, you, the thing, the main thing you need with climbing hydrangeas is patience because right. it takes them forever to do anything, and then once they do it, they they go. Um, and it's great all season. Really, it's all all your interest. Um, you know, you get these where the flowers are just out of main flower now, but there's still some interest there. They stay, obviously they're persistent on the plant, so they're there all right. winter. Um, in fall, it gets really beautiful yellow color. Uh, it's great to have in the garden and it's really adaptable in terms of where, at least in my garden, right. where I can grow it. Here it's, it's in sort of a, a half sun situation. I also have another one growing on the north side of the garage. So um, it just, right. it's really, really adaptable and it's a, it's a great plant as long as you know what you're getting into with it. Right. So if Steph will start spinning the camera around, you have some, still some fairly large trees, even though you've lost some uh, as well. Uh, and you have this perfect mixture of dappled light where you can really blend things, you know, which I talk about frequently. Uh -huh. You can get away with mixing a lot of sun and shade if, you're, if your shade is like this, where yeah. it's not, you're still getting direct sun. Right. Yeah. We are really fortunate to have many mature trees on mm -hmm. this property. Yeah. We have some American beeches that yeah. are among my favorites. We just lost my very favorite tree, unfortunately, it just sort of fell over. Uh -huh. We've got a lot of these giant spruces yes. which grow right. really, really quickly. They're, they're really interesting trees, um, mm -hmm. and they seem to be quite sturdy. Right. Um, we've got a, a beautiful old maple here right. um, that is, is just a gem to have. And the roots running out on it. And the roots running out on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, we're just we're just really fortunate to have found a place with with uh, nice mature trees on it. Because right. Of course, that's not always the case. And then we have along the edges of our property, we've got more of the spruces, um, mm. lots of cedar trees here. Right. So. So this garden bed over here has been something that's um, worked on a little bit, but it's kind of one of those forgotten areas where you sort of stick things. So there's a lot of shrubs in here because low maintenance was really important. But one. One thing that was very intentional here was this tree, and this is Picea glauca hudsonii. And uh, it's just a really skinny, narrow growing tree with a bit of a drooping habit that doesn't take up a lot of space, but offers great color and interest over here in this garden, particularly obviously winter interest, but also this time of year. And some years it gets a ton of really beautiful purple cones on it. This year was not a great year for cones on it, but sometimes you get that great interest on that. And then we've got some, uh, a bunch of different shrubs that have grown in here. I've got, um, this is Catinus Golden Spirit, uh, actually growing in a pot um, because I've just sort of moved it around and experiment with it, which I, I like to try growing different things in containers just to see what happens. And we've got, um, obviously there's a clematis growing up, this little trellis here as well as some other things. And then I've got my other, this is another uh, climbing hydrangea growing against the north side of the garage here. And uh, I don't do anything to it, except sometimes I will prune out to make sure you can still see the window. And just in the past couple of years, I've started letting it go around the corner to the front of the garage. I kind of wish I had done that sooner because I think eventually it will stretch kind of over to the little pergola that we have over the doors there. But I think it softens that corner and has kind of an interesting look to it. All right, so what's your... Uh... This is Japanese maple. Yeah, so this is uh, Acer Shirazawanum uh -huh. Moonrise. Yes. Uh, and it sustained a little bit of winter damage. It lost a little bit of its top this right. year. So I did a little pruning, but I think it's still pretty. It oh, still offers this great color here, and it's still got fairly good form. So we'll see where it goes from here. But it's a nice addition, I think, to this this end of this little corner. It is, and it's a great pop of color. And we, we talked about your uh, the blue spruce. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in, in the in the Q and A, what's this one again? Uh, that's a blue globe spruce. Blue globe. Uh, dwarf blue globe spruce. Okay, yeah. gotcha. How long has that been in? The... Oh, that's probably ten. That's eleven years, ten years now. From a from a you know probably a two gallon pot. Okay, nice, mm -hmm. nice. You do a, a lot of annuals from seed. Mm -hmm. That's something that's similar on both our channels yep. as we're doing is we're trying you know um, the pop, some of the poppies are you did from seed just stone and then some of them are just. Some of them planted themselves. Planted themselves, yes. which is the which is the perfect. And we're in July, and your poppies are 
blooming and yeah, we're like peak, yeah. we're peak poppy season right now. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 they're really stunning. You've got a lot of clematis in the garden. Yep. And this, you know, got one growing mm -hmm. on a tree, which is just how they would grow. Mm -hmm. You know, in a lot of gardens we go to, folks have figured out you can just put, a, especially one that's going to get cut down. Right. So it's not like it's ever going to strangle the tree. Exactly. Uh, you know, it's going to get cut down. Uh, and we'll, we'll, let's move around this edge, okay. uh, Steph. It's really my favorite way to grow clematis. I think it's so much more natural looking than having a bunch of, you know, you can only have so much right. ornament in a garden, at yeah. least in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, right. You don't want a trellis everywhere you look. So it's a great way to be able to work, work something like that in. Nice, nice. And a plant that was already limbing itself up anyway. Exactly, yes. Right. It help, It does help fill this one in a little bit. Your alliums just in general probably are much, I mean, th these are perennials. For, I mean, for us, we're in 7B and they, you know, we're best to just buy them already cold treated oh, and yeah. we can get this, but, uh, so, you know. Yeah, no, this is Mount Everest and I bet you these have been here for six years. Right, even probably. my, even my cold treated Mount Everest mm -hmm. might be this. They're yeah. beautiful, but they're, they're yeah. not, they're not, yep. they're not, they're not doing that yep. at all. And so m moving around here, this yeah. is the back of the dogwood that we, yep. that we, that we started mm -hmm. with. And again, you can see this layering that she has down to the, uh, down to the front of the beds and mm -hmm. so much te color and texture and, uh, more lot, lots more clematis yep uh, yeah this is sapphire indigo this is on my list of sort of top five clematis probably yeah. perpetually and uh -huh. i let it just sort of flop over this wall and, right. do, and kind of i maneuver it around if i need to but it will bloom it, it blooms it's probably my longest blooming clematis in the garden wow yeah it's 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 super super striking all these pinks this is all almost all pinks and lavenders and you know with a little mm -hmm. pop-up yeah. yellow in here this is a this is a really planned but doesn't present itself as <laughs> right you know you know what i mean right. it's like a perfect right. it's the perfect orderly chaos yeah there's, it's, a, it's there's a, a certain amount of planning and then yes. there's definitely some not so much planning and right see how it works and you've got a retaining wall back here yep. so this has been layered yep uh layered up over time what's your uh uh, that's well, uh, that's uh, uh, a grafted uh, Salix uh, uh -huh. purpurea pendula gotcha up there um yeah which is uh you know, I'm, I've, I've struggled with the right tree for that for that spot. I've uh -huh. tried several different things. So far, this is working out, but it, it can get a little bit bigger than I would like it to. The good news is, is that I just keep pruning at it, You're and right. it really <laughs> has no problem with that whatsoever. Right, and then moving around, you've got yeah. lots of pops of uh, color in here with your hosta and your grasses. I like the use of grasses in your landscape. And I talked about this, and on our little small lot, we really, I mean, it just we don't get a lot of wind through the space anyway but you have this open space near the lake and these grasses sitting in here create movement and it's a whole yeah. additional element to the garden when you can right. get movement in the garden it's yeah. it's not one that we talk about a lot you can talk about color and texture and all those right. kinds of things but but when you can introduce movement into a garden it's a it's an entirely different element and it's, right. if you have that opportunity i'd love to take it when i can yeah nice and so uh, you got some uh, hydrangeas up in the Yep, we got some limelights along the back there, uh -huh. and on either side of the staircase here, those are both Incredibles. Um, so they they do their thing pretty 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 effortlessly. Right, and you see any gardens that I visit, uh, shrubs limbing themselves up and stretching. A lot of people are like it's stretching, it's stretching. What do I do? Yep, tuck something yeah, under it. Absolutely. <laughs> You'll see in every garden we do like this. Uh, yep. we're, we're tucking things under them. Uh, that's the next. And then when that thing limbs itself up, we're tucking under that. Exactly. And it's yeah. such a great opportunity to put more, to put more, tuck more things in. Right. I think. Yeah. And you get to see the structure of the plant. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, it actually has a nice uh, structure yeah. on its own. Yep. Uh, Lift it up like that. Well, thank you very much. This I'm is so an awesome glad visit. you came. This was yes. so neat to have you here, and yeah. it's always fun to talk about the differences in our in our gardens yeah, and, and right. get someone else's perspective. I like having people in my garden because I right. I enjoy seeing through other people's eyes what they see in my garden. It, 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 we and I got to go six to eight weeks back in time. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> to, to a place it's a time long machine. Ago. You come to the time machine. It yeah. is. It is a time machine here. This is it's beautiful. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks.